the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah Azza wa Jal, he told us in the Quran, نَحْنُ نَقُصُ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we will, we will tell you, O Muhammad, we, we tell you, O Muhammad, the best of stories. The best of stories. Now, all of the stories that Allah Azza wa Jal, he tells us in the Quran are from the best of stories. But like some of the ulama, they took from this surah, this story, that the fact that Allah mentioned in the surah Yusuf, where the story of Yusuf is being mentioned, that we reveal all to you, Muhammad, the best of stories, and the story of Yusuf is the best of stories. And if you were to just look at this story from the angle of its storytelling value, then wallahi, there is no narrative out there in any drama or any story that you might hear, watch, see, listen to, that has a greater storyline than the story of Yusuf I mean, in here, you have your own brothers trying to kill you. In here, you have the danger and the fitna of women. In here, you have a father losing his child. So much pain that he becomes blind because of the tears that he cried. You have being distance away from your family, thrown into a well to land up in another city as a slave. In that same city where you were taken as a slave, you then become one of the governors of the city, of the country rather. You have the story of rags to riches. You end up in jail. You have jail time. You have what dreams being interpreted, prophecies coming true. You have yourself being united with those who are your loved ones that you lost at the end. You have your enemies, assalamu alaikum. You have your enemies coming back to you when you are in a position of strength. So imagine a person has a problem with some people and there was a time when he was weak and they violated him. But then they come back to him when now he's the boss and he runs the area now and he's the big man in the streets. And what does he do? He forgives them. This story has a lot in there. And in it, there are lessons. For those who ponder But the thing here My brothers and sisters Is that You see we don't tell stories For the sake of entertainment In fact The Salaf of Salih Were very much against people Who would just Stand up to tell stories Because story is Telling is a way to captivate people But you don't learn any lessons from there I mean we can Listen to stories And tell each other stories all day But what did you learn? Did you walk away with any substance? Did you acquire any ilm? Did this benefit you A lesson that you can apply in your life? You see, the stories of the prophets, they are for lessons to be taken from them. As Allah said at the end of Surah to Yusuf, after he told us this amazing story, Allah said, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that inside of these stories, the stories of the prophets, they are ibara, they are lessons that are to be taken. These lessons, what do they do? What purpose do these ibar serve? They serve guidance to you. Out of the darkness They serve advices to you Towards doing good things They serve warnings to you From falling into things that might destroy you But for who? Ulil albab Those people who are people of understanding The people who give understanding Who are people who have understanding Not just that At the beginning of the surah Look what Allah said And I really want you to have this Understanding in your head Why we're here we're not here just so we can hear a nice story, maybe walk away with a little iman boost. No, we're here so we can acquire guidance from this story. Ibar. We want to acquire lessons, morals from this story. Because whatever I told you that this story goes through, I told you enemies. Who here doesn't suffer, have problems with enemies? Okay, you might not have people that are running after you, trying to kill you on the streets, but we have enemies inside of our families, right? Who here doesn't suffer from jealousy? People maybe in your family, outside your family. Who here doesn't struggle with the fitna of women, and for women, the fitna of men? Who here doesn't suffer from loss of maybe loved ones? They could be through dying, whatever it may be, illnesses. What? This, this story is our story. The story of Yusuf, alayhi salam, it combines in it our story. We live this. Does that make sense? But we live it not knowing what to do. He was a man to whom Allah was sending revelation. So the way Allah guided him and he and his family, his brothers, Yaqub, his father, who was also a prophet, the way that they guided themselves and they made the, and the, the way that they, 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 they traversed through these calamities and these difficulties, these ups and these downs, these smiles and these frowns, in it are lessons for us to take. 
But not everyone benefits from the story of Yusuf People hear it, people go to these lessons People have listened to the story before I think when I came in I heard some brothers in the back reciting Surah Yusuf Maybe getting himself ready into the mode But why is it that people don't benefit from this story? Because Allah Azza wa told us that there is only a certain type of people that will benefit from the story of Yusuf. Allah said, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتُ بِالسَّائِلِينَ That inside the, the story and the incident and the tale of Yusuf and his brothers are ayat. There are signs, there are lessons, there are ibar, there are morals, there's guidance, there's benefits. For who? For people who are inquiring, questioning, wanting to know. They want answers. They are living a life and they need answers to questions. They need answers to the problems that they have. Imam Abdurrahman ibn Nasir Si'li rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned this asking doesn't necessarily have to be by tongue. It could be through your situation. Sometimes a person He's not actually asking, hey, how do I solve this problem? How do I get out of this situation? But his situation is calling out for help. His situation is saying, can you please help me? That person, if he comes and he listens and he learns and he studies the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, in him, in him he will find this guidance. He will find this guidance in this, in this story. Does that make sense? But then Sheikh Abdurrahman ibn Nasir Si'li, ta'ala, he mentioned, that a person who is a mu'rid, he's turning away, he doesn't want to know. He's just living life, he's got problems, but he's just diving deep into those problems. And he doesn't care. He's not even trying to get out. He's not even looking for help. He's happy with his life. The kind of person who's on the street, is doing whatever the hell he's doing, he doesn't care. He enjoys the life, he loves it. He doesn't think to himself, ah, I'm only stuck selling drugs because I don't have another way. He actually loves it. He loves it. Not that selling drugs is okay in any situation. But he, he enjoys this life. He's a mu'rid. He's turned away completely. He doesn't even ask him for guidance. So brothers, sisters, when we come here, we come with the mindset that we're here, we're here to ask for help. Guidance from Allah Azza wa Jalla. And perhaps we will see this. Perhaps we will get the answers. The answers to the questions that we've been asking our whole life in this surah. Does that make sense? But with that said, it's important that you do follow the story. So I, every lesson, inshallah ta'ala, I'll start off by telling you a portion of the story. And I'm not going to tell you the story in much detail or spend a lot of time on the storytelling. That's up there, that's online, you can get the story. I'm more concerned in the lessons that we can take from the story. So we're going to rush through the first part of the story as quick as possible. And then inshallah ta'ala, we will go into acquiring and benefiting the lessons from the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. So, the story begins with a dream. Yusuf alayhi salam, he tells his father, he says, Ya abati, inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaba. He said, my father. And by the way, look how Yusuf speaks to his dad. He says, Ya abati. He didn't say, Ya abi. Abi means my father. Ya abati is a way to really speak to your dad in a soft, loving, respectful way. Look at the way some of us, we talk to our dad. Dad! Yo, dad! It's about tone. Okay, okay, dad, dad. Okay, dad's a respectable term. That's what he said. Dad! Audi billahi min zalik. So we learn manners from Yusuf Ali son and how he spoke to his father. He said, Inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaba washams walqabr Ra'aytuhum li sajidi. He said, I saw the sun and the moon in my dream. And I also saw 11 stars. And what were they doing? They were doing sajda to me. His father says, Ya Bunay. When his father had this dream, his father interpreted the dream straight away. What was the interpretation? We'll come to it. But when the father had the dream, he realized it's a big dream. My son's had a big dream. This has a big meaning, an amazing meaning. So he says to his son, Ya Bunay. He didn't say Yabni. He didn't say Ya Ibni. He didn't say, Oh my son. He said, Ya Bunay. Oh my beloved son. Look at the way the father speaks to his child. Look at the way the father he speaks to his child. It goes both ways. Okay? 
You want your child to speak to you in a respectful way, he learns respect from you. He learns respect from you. If he sees you in the house effing and blinding, talking a certain way, he's going to learn that and talk in that exact same way. Does that make sense? So the father goes out of his way. He didn't say, yeah, Ibn. He didn't say, oh, oh, oh my son. He says, yeah, Abu Lay, oh, my beloved son. It's how he really so love. La taqsus. Do not narrate, do not tell ru'yaka, do not tell this dream that you just had to your brothers. Why? They may plot against you. They may plot against you. In the shaytan lil insani adu mubin. Verily, shaytan is a clay cut enemy to mankind. And what happens after is that the scene changes from this discussion where Yusuf is telling the dream to his father, and Allah he brings us to the brothers of Yusuf. There's 11 brothers of them. And. They speak to each other and they say, Our father, he loves Yusuf and his other, other brother, who's the one that was just older than Yusuf. His name was Benjamin, which in English or in the Bible they call him Benjamin. Benjamin, okay? Benjamin is the brother of Yusuf. So he said, Our father, he loves them more than he loves us. They clocked. Something's wrong here. Our dad doesn't love us the way he loves them. He loves them more than he loves us. So they spilled a jealousy inside of them. So they plotted to get rid of Yusuf. So one of them said, he said, kill Yusuf. Or throw him away somewhere far. Distance him from our father. And why? What do they want? What do they want? They want their father's acceptance. They want to be the first at the top of the list in terms of their dad. So they said, once you get rid of Yusuf, then what we do, you'll be able to gain your father's like full love and full you know, attention. One of them said, لا تقتل يوسف. Don't kill Yusuf. Don't do that. Rather, take him and throw him inside of a well. And what will happen is that people, when they travel from far, they come to the well for water. When they come, they're going to go there looking for water, but they'll find him. And then they'll take him away on a caravan. They'll probably take him as a slave. They'll take him far away from us. So they plotted and they planned and they said, this is what we're going to do. The next day, they come to the father. They come to Yaqub. Father's a prophet, by the way. Yaqub is a prophet. And who else is a prophet? His son, Yusuf, is a prophet. Okay? And as a side benefit, just to let you know, you know when we say Israel or Israel, does anyone know who Israel is? Does Israel is a name. Israel. Israel is a name. Does anyone know who Israel is? Who is it? Did I answer it? He's a servant of Allah, but which one? Ya'qub. Ya'qub, the father of Joseph, is? Is who? It is Israel. That's one of his names. So when we say Banu Israel, the children of Israel, who are we talking about? These 12 sons. They had lineage that came from them, offspring that came from them. And each one of these 12, they gave birth to their own tribes. They grew and they grew and they grew. And that is what we call Banu Israel. So question, nowadays, people, why don't they ever call their son Israel? They never call their child Israel. Why, why would they not do that? If, 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 if you had a son and you said, yeah, I'm calling my son Israel, I'm calling him Israel, the brothers are going to start throwing stones at you. Look at the ignorance and stupidity. Their hatred for a people made them so... So over the top that they started to despise the name of a prophet. Our issue is not with is not with the Israelites. Our issue and understand this by the way. It's very important. Our issue is not with the Israelites. You know what they say at, you know we're anti Semitic. Semitic is talking about the Israelite race. Semitism or Semitics are the Israelites. No. Isa was an Israeli, Dawood was an Israeli, Suleiman was an Israeli, Zakaria was an Israeli, Yahya was an Israeli. These prophets, they were from Banu Israel. Our issue is with Judaism. With what? A religion. We have a religious difference. So we're not racist people. We're not people that hate people based on race. There are people who are Israeli, who are in Israel, that are Muslim. There were 
great imams from the Salaf of Salih that were called Israel, Israel ibn Yunus. So it's ignorance. Does that make sense? And also don't let don't let these Zionists trap you and tell you, hey, you're anti Semitic. Say, get, get the hell out of it, bro. What do you mean anti Semitic? I love some Israelis. I love some Semites. More than I love my own mom and dad. I love Yaqub. I love Isa. I love Musa. I love Harun. These are all Israelites. I love them. My issue is what? With Judaism, Zionism. I have a religious, I have a creedal conflict with you people. Does that make sense? And they're allowed to differ and disagree and have conflicts, even on a society level, in this society where we talk about freedom of expression, freedom of speech. You're allowed to differ when it comes to religion. But you're not allowed to put people down based on their race and their creed. Of course, we as Muslims, we, we, we differ with that. Does that make sense? We, so we agree with that. We don't put anyone down because of their race or their colour. Their religion is the problem that we have. as a side benefit. So anyway, they come to Yaqub slash Israel, both are his names, and they come to him and they say, Father, Salaam Alaikum. They say, Father, why is it that you don't send Yusuf out with us? Why is it that you don't send him out to play with us? وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَنَاصِحُونَ And we well wishes for him, we care about our brother. Look at, look, at, look at how Shaytan played them here. They're planning seconds ago or moments ago to kill him. And now what do they want to do? They want to throw him in a well. But they come to the father and they say, we're well wishes. Send him with us. So we can play, take him out to the desert, have a good time. And the father says, I'm, I get saddened by the fact that perhaps... Whilst you're with him, you may become a bit careless and maybe like a wolf or something might eat him because we're talking those times, like he, you're living in the wild wilderness. So a wolf can just come, grab you, grab your child and walk away. They even talk back to their father and they say, Dad, is a wolf really going to take him and we're a big group? We're a big group. We're a gang. We're a team. We're a squad out here. And by the way, I forgot to mention earlier, earlier, when they said, our father, he loves Yusuf and his brother more than he loves us. And what did they say? They said, we're a group. I said, how can, how can our father love them? And look at us, we're ten sons. We're ten strong, strong sons. They're placing value on their number. Yusuf, alayhi salam, didn't love... So Yaqub, the father, didn't love his son Yusuf based on the fact that, you know, he was big or strong. No. He loved him based on the quality that was inside of him that Allah placed in his heart for him. But they were looking at it from the angle of number. Look at us, we're mighty, we're strong. Brothers, don't base anything based on your number. Don't base anything based on your size. It means nothing. Even the Sahaba, when they came to the Battle of Hunayn and they thought with the 10,000 army strong, they said, today we're going to win. Why? Because they have a big number. Allah started to make them lose, to show them. Don't be amazed by how much, how large you are. In the Battle of Badr, the Sahaba, they won the battle against one, uh, 900 plus people and they were outnumbered 3 to 1 it's got nothing to do about the number it's not about the quantity, it's the quality and that's a constant theme in our deen it's not about how many actions you do it's about how well you do those actions does that make sense? so now they convince the father Yaqub to let Yusuf come out with them they convince him so he says no problem, I'll let him come and what do they do? فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ Ajma'u, they, when they went out with him, they came together, they grabbed Yusuf. And what did they do? They threw their own brother. By the way, he's about seven years old right now. He's about seven years old. They throw him inside of the well. And then they walk away. What happens next? We'll carry on next week. But now let's take lessons from that which we've learned so far. Lesson number one, we learn that dreams have meanings. And you can take notes, inshallah, it'll be good if you do. If you didn't bring pen, paper, notepad, you could take them on your phone at the very least. Uh, but please, from next week, try and bring pen, paper, inshallah, ta'ala, or laptop or something. So now, the first lesson that we learn is that dreams have interpretations. And in the story of Yusuf and Surah to Yusuf, we have the foundations. We have the usul of the science of dream interpretation. We have its absolute foundations. Does that make sense? And this is something that a person will go deep and dive deep into one who wants to understand the science and the knowledge of dream interpretation. But it's something that we don't want to go too deep into. We just want to benefit a few little things here or there. Number one, the first benefit is that dreams are of three types. The dreams are of three types. 
The first type of dream is Ru'ya Sahiha. It is a correct dream, a dream from Allah Azza wa Jal. It is a dream when you know your soul it leaves your body every night. Do you not know that your soul leaves your body at night? Do you know this? You should be very scared when you go to sleep that you may not wake up in the morning. Do you know this? When you you know sleep is the is the Akhul Maut, it's the brother of death. And when you wake up every morning, it's a reminder of the resurrection. Allah put your soul back into your body. And that's why the Azkar, the Prophet taught us, which are in the fortress of Muslim, they remind us, Bismika Rabbi Wada'atu Janbi, Wabika Arfa'uhu, etc. So on you can look them up. You say, Allah, you know, with your name I I I I I, I lay down and my soul when it goes up to you tonight. فَإِنْ أَمْسَكْتَ نَفْسِي If you hold back my soul, then have mercy on it. And if you send it back, then protect it. Protect me, and so on and so forth. So the point is, your soul, it leaves your body. And you should read these athkar. And you should remember death every time you go to sleep. That's why the other dhikr that you read, بِسْمِكَ اللَّهُمَّ أَمُوتُ وَأَحْيَا Allah, in your name, we die and we live. Because you're about to die when you sleep. It's a mini death. It's a short death. Does that make sense? Anyway, side point. So when you go through that mini death, your soul leaves your body, and Allah Azza wa Jal He inspires onto the soul some things, okay, that may come, that may transpire in the future. Some glad tidings Allah might give you. If there is someone that was, you know, an enemy trying to deceive you, Allah may show you inside of your dream. Allah Azza wa Jal. Sometimes you may see yourself burning in the hellfire in your dream. That's not a bad dream. It's a good dream. It's a good dream because it might lead you to repent from sins. Today, so that you don't go into the hellfire on that day To remind you if you do, Like for example, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, He had a dream that he was the son of Umar ibn Khattab Sorry, the, the son of Umar ibn Khattab He had a dream that he was being taken to the hellfire So he went to his sister Hafsa Who was married to the Prophet And he asked her to ask the Prophet him To interpret his dream on his behalf And what did he say? The Prophet interpreted He said that he is a righteous man The dream means he is a righteous man But he should pray the night prayer He should never leave off the night prayer so that wasn't a bad dream, it was a dream to encourage him. He said, you're a good man, you're good. But pray the night prayer. The night prayer is going to keep you far, inshallah ta'ala, away from these kind of things like the hellfire, whatever have you. So even if you see yourself being you know, in a punishment, the grave or whatever, it's not a bad dream necessarily. It could be a good dream. A ru'ya, a sahiha, and this is one from Allah Azza wa where Allah is inspiring. He's inspiring into the soul at time when you're sleeping and the soul is separated from the body. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Good, that's the first type. The second type of dream is a dream which is from shaitan. It's a dream from shaitan. In the dream you might see an image, you might see a little jinn, a big jinn, a mini jinn, I don't know, you might see, you might see snakes, scorpions. Um, and these dreams, sometimes shaitan just, make, just try to scare you in your dream. He might just sometimes try to scare you in your dream. Does that make sense? And these dreams, generally speaking, they don't have an interpretation. It's just shaitan playing games with you, uh, trying to scare you. A person shouldn't, uh, for example, shaitan might make you see some bad stuff. It's just from shaitan. He's not really trying to, you know, it's just, he's just trying to mess with you. He wants to affect you in your life. Does that make sense? He might see you, uh, you know, something bad happens to you the next day, so you don't go and walk in that direction because you stop feeling all, you know, superstitious or, you know, nervous or cautious about your dream. Not superstitious because it's a dream, but you know, you know what I'm saying? He's just trying to have an effect in your life. You ignore this one. But generally speaking, if you do see sometimes, you know, like jinn and scorpions, you should go to a dream interpreter because it could be signs of possession, evil eye and so on. It could be signs of these kind of things. Um, but if it is just definitely a dream from shaitan, then there's no really weight that's given it to it. It's ignored and you keep it moving. Okay. The third type of dream is a dream which is hadith al nafs. Which is a dream just based on your thoughts. You, you went to sleep and you know you were thinking about marrying that sister and then you saw her in your dream. Brother, don't come to me the next day and say, well, I actually think that that was a dream that I should marry her. That was a sign I should marry her. But you think about her 24-7. That's why she ended up in your dream. <laughs> Does that make sense? It doesn't have any weight. Maybe it doesn't have to be something you were thinking about just before you slept. It could have been something that's just been on your mind a lot. And it just pops up in your dream. So don't think too deeply about it. Now here's the thing. Yusuf salam was praised by Allah with the ability to be able to interpret dreams. And what happened? Subhanallah, Yusuf salam had the skill to distinguish between the dream which was the correct one from Allah. The dream which was from shaitan. And the dream which is just your own nafs talking to you. He was able to distinguish between which one is which. Now this is just your nafs. Ignore it. This is from shaitan. Ignore it. This is correct. 
and he was also able to understand the, and extract the lessons that were within these dreams. I don't want to go too much more into the issue of dream interpretation or whatever have you. It's just the fact is that to understand there are three types of dreams. Inshallah ta'ala, um, let's now go into the interpretation of Yusuf's dream himself. So what did his dream mean? So he said, he said, what did he say? He said, رَأَيْتُ أَحَدَ عَشَرَ كَوْكَبَ He said, I saw, ten, uh, I saw 11 stars. 11 stars. وَالشَّمْسِ And the sun. وَالْقَبَرِ And the moon. رَأَيْتُهُمْ He said, I saw them. Assalamu alaikum. I saw them. لِي سَاجِدِينَ they were making sajda to me. I saw 11 stars, the sun and the moon, they were making sajda to me. Does that make sense? Now, this dream, Ya'qub interpreted it straight away. Why? How do we know Ya'qub interpreted it? Because Ya'qub said, Ya Bunay, la taqsus ru'yaka ala ikhwatika. Do not tell your dream to your brothers. Don't let them know. Don't let them find out about this. Fayakidu laka kayda. They may plot against you. They may start to plot against you when they hear this dream. Out of jealousy Because it's a big dream It's a powerful dream What's the power in the dream? Ya'qub understood This is going to take my son To a very high station Very high station Is the sun something big? Is the moon something big? Are the stars something big? They're big right? And when they're making sajda to you And by the way One of those is a prophet of Allah Who is Ya'qub Then what does that show you? About you? Are you have you not reached a high station? Have you not reached a high plateau? Have you not reached somewhere in the dunya and the akhirah? You reached very high, right? So, from this, it was a good news, it's a good dream that Yusuf, my little, my son, who's seven right now, you're going to be a big man. You're going to become a very big man, a very big honorable man. Does that make sense? So, from this, when he understood that, he told him, don't tell anyone. Now, pay attention. A couple issues here. Making sajda, is it allowed in our sharia? No, it's not allowed. The Prophet wasallam said that if there was anyone that I was going to command to make sajda to someone, I would have told the wife to make sajda to the husband. But the sajda is only for Allah. It's not allowed for anyone except for Allah. But remember, the sharia of the people before, the law and the legislation of the people before, allows some things in which Allah, He changed the legislation, He abrogated in our sharia. So if anyone was to do sajda now, we fear for them shirk akbar If anyone wants to make sajda to someone else other than Allah, even if they say, oh, you know, I'm trying to do it out of respect, or I went to the grave, I did it out of respect, we fear for them shirk akbar That's what we fear for them. Stay away from it. Because our sharia, it cut it. Why? Because it wants to eliminate anything that may lead to shirk. But it was allowed at the time. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمِ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ That's why Allah, when He made Adam, He told all of the angels and Iblis to make sajda to him. فَسَجَدُوا They all made sajda except for Iblis. So it was not them worshipping someone besides Allah because at that time the sajda was just seen. And you all know what sajda is, right? When you take your head and you put it on the ground. When you do in salah. When you do in the prayer. So they all understood that time sajda was just a way to greet each other. So then, so then the dream here means that the sun, the moon and the eleven stars they're going to come and they're going to greet Yusuf by making sajda to him. It was allowed then, it's not allowed in our time. Now the question comes to mind, who are the sun and the moon and who are these 11 stars? At the end of the story, as you'll see when we come to it, when Yusuf alayhi salam is now a big man, he's a big man, he's a governor from the governors of Egypt. He's gone from being taken away from his father, he's gone from being thrown in a well, taken as a slave, trying to be, you know, violated by these women, thrown into prison, his prison sentence has been accepted, uh, extended, sorry. All of that, to finally becoming what? A leader within the land. And his same brothers who they tried to get rid of him now come back basically begging for forgiveness. Yeah? Needing him. And what happens? Then they make sajda to him. And his mom and his dad made sajda to him. And he said, Father, he said, this is the interpretation of that dream. This is the interpretation of that dream that he told him many, 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 many years prior. Does that make sense? So then the sun and the moon is the mom and the dad. The ulama did differ. Was the mom here the sun or was the mom here the moon? We're not going to go into that discussion. But the sun and the moon is the mom and dad here. And the 11 stars are what? They're the brothers. Does that make sense? They are the brothers. We're going to come back to the issue of the brothers being like 11 stars and what it signifies. Why were they shown as stars? Because isn't a star something good? 
Isn't a star something nice? Isn't it something that beautifies the sky and it guides the one who's stuck in, uh, stranded in the night? But these brothers, do they seem good? Are they good brothers? I'm not sure, are they good brothers? They, just, they wanted to kill him, some, one of them. Others, they wanted to what? They, they, they grabbed him, they threw him, seven year old boy into the well. They don't seem like good brothers, but why did Allah signify them as stars? We'll come to that, inshallah ta'ala. The point here is that this is the meaning of the dream. They were the 11 stars. Now pay attention. Here, this dream, it shows that Yusuf alayhi salam, because his father has interpreted it for him, or he's interpreted it and it signified to him, that this dream is going to what? Be a good tide, glad tiding. It's going to be a bishara, a good news for Yusuf alayhi salam. And even though Yusuf alayhi salam, he was going through so much struggle inside of that well, as a slave inside of the house of the Aziz of Egypt, when, he was, when those women were trying to trap him, there were dangerous women. A lot of dangerous women now, around now do as well. In the case of Kunna Azim, Allah said the plotting of the women is dangerous. In the same sort of, we'll come to it next week though, inshallah, the issue of the women. So they tried to plot. He's in prison. He's going through all these difficulties, separated from his dad, seven year sentence. He gets extended, what, 14 years? Longer he stays in prison, another seven years, 14 altogether. What happens? All of this pain and calamity and suffering, but he re- he's got that dream that he had as a child that would give him a sense of ease. Shah Abdul Rahman ibn Nasr certainly he mentioned it. it would give him a sense of ease. It was to make ease for him throughout that difficulty that you will come out of the darkness one day. You will make it out of the difficult situation. And brothers, sisters, that's for all of us. Even Allah has maybe not specific, specifically given you a glad tiding as He mentioned you by name. But did Allah not say in the Quran, وَالْعَاقِبَةُ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِيدِ That the final ending, the final ending, when all the chips are down, and when everything is finished, وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِيدِ The people of taqwa, they're the ones who will be at the top of the end. The final ending is for the people of taqwa. So for you to know, whenever you have a difficulty, my brother, Whatever pain you're going through, whether it be financial issues, family issues, you know, heartbreak issues, police issues, case issues, whatever it might be, just know that Allah has mentioned. And this is a statement from Him in His Quran. And He will not lie and turn back on His word. That the final ending, it will be for the people of Taqwa. The end result will be, wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It will be for the people who come with. But the people who come with piety Does that make sense? Good So that was the first benefit that we took on the issue of dreams And in there we had some other benefits Now we move on to the second benefit Which is That And this is important for parents to listen to And you will many of you some, one day be parents If you're not are already And I guess it can kind of apply if you have more than one wife as well You'll see what I mean here in a second And that is that you should treat your children equal you should treat your children equally Because what was it that led the brothers of Yusuf to want to kill him And later retract that but get rid of him and throw him inside of a well It was because they didn't feel that their father loved them Now a person, and you have to understand something For the parents who are here, please if you pay attention to this One of the foundations in raising your children well What we call tarbiyatul awlad Cultivating and raising your children one of the foundations is to treat them all fairly. Shall I tell you why? Because if you are equal in your bir, in your good and your kindness and your love to your children, they will be good to you when they, they will be, they'll come to you with good bir in, in terms of bir al They'll be good to you as a, as, a, as a parent. Wallahi, parents who treat their children unjust, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, a, in a way that's not equal or a way that's not just. They give one more privilege over the other. In my country, where I'm from, they treat men, boys, better than they treat girls. They do it still till today. They have this jahili practice. Oh, she's a daughter. Doesn't matter. It's like a second class citizen. Wallahi, the children, they feel it. And they have resentment towards their parents. And of course, they should always be dutiful to their parents. Even if their parents were bad to them. You should always be. But, reality is that when people have that in their hearts, they're not able to show that bir towards their parents. So you want your kids to be good to you? Treat them all equal because they will hold it in their heart against you. Number one. Number two, one of the things as parents that we want 
is that we want our children to be united. We don't want them to differ when we die. Some of us have got brothers, siblings that we don't get on with. Some of us have seen our parents have got siblings that they don't get on with. They're fighting over silly things like land and this and that and whatever have you back home. Right? What takes away from them having animosity against one another is you treating them equally. Because when you treat one better than the other, the others will start to hate him. Hasid, jealousy is a thing that's real. It exists. It's evil. It's a crime. It's a disease of the heart. But it exists. And when these... Kids have that towards, their, towards another sibling of this, it will show and then they will fight against one another. So treat them all equal. Now, does that mean Yaqub treated his other children unequally and unfairly? No, not at all. He tried his best, but the ulama, Shaykh Abdul Rahman Riyas, certainly you mentioned that sometimes, you know, love, when you have so much love for someone, it kind of just overtakes you and maybe it shows, or the effect of that love shows. And the other children, they can sense it. So Qadr Allahu Masha Fa'al. Allah He made it so that even though Yaqub was trying his best to keep it fair, the other kids they found out that Yusuf is more beloved to the father than him, than them. So what did they do? Because of it, Hasid came and they decided to fight against one another. And that's very important to mention. The third benefit that we take, inshaAllah ta'ala, is on the issue of jealousy. And the effect that jealousy has on Islamic brotherhood. Brothers, you have to understand something. That jealousy, hasid is a disease And wallahi if you look at a lot of the problems that people have with each other It comes down to just pure jealousy sometimes Just pure jealousy He has something that I don't have He has something that I don't have And this is a problem Because It's you not being content with the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal Allah gave him something he didn't give you Allah felt it was best place to give him that and not to give you that and his jealousy, what does it do? It leads to a lot of evil. Jealousy leads to killing. A lot of the a lot of the killings that we see and we hear about on the streets nowadays comes from what? Based on jealousy. Jealousy. If you look at where the problem started from, two areas are beefing with each other. Why? Because a guy from one area had a girlfriend, or he wanted to just be with a girl. And a guy from another end, he ended up linking that same girl. And because of it, things escalated. That area and this area are now beefing and then they're killing each other. And it started from jealousy. Jealousy is something that you have to be very, very, very far away from. Does that make sense? On the issue of the brothers wanting to kill Yusuf because of the issue of jealousy, I want to mention three points. Okay, three points. Because even though a brother might do you wrong because of jealousy, I want you to remember... He's sick. He's still your brother at the end of the day. No matter what he wants to do to you, no matter how much evil he's trying to come with, as a result of his jealousy, he is still your brother in Islam. And, and this brings me to my point about Yusuf's brothers. He, he said, Ara'aytu ahad ashara kawkaba. He said, I saw 11 stars. So in the dream, his brothers, they were seen as stars. And I asked your question earlier. I said, is a person who tries to kill someone, who tries to throw someone in a well, disobey the father by taking the child away from the father, cause the father so much pain and do X, Y, Z. Is this person a good, righteous person? No, but a star is a sign of goodness. A star, it gives and it emits out light. The traveller at night, he can guide himself. Those who understand how the mapping of the stars is in the sky, they can find their way back home and make it from one place in the world to another place in the world. How did they used to navigate when they were on the seas, in the oceans back in the days? They used to look at the stars and they used to navigate based on that. Does that make sense? It even beautifies the sky. You look up at night when it's dark, you think, wow, look, the sky is so beautiful, amazing. And these brothers are being likened to stars. They're being likened to what? They're being likened to stars Because they repented And they came back from that crime that they committed And when they came back from that crime They became like stars They became good And what does that tell you? Is that sometimes a brother That tries to harm you He might try to harm you But he's still got the potential And the propensity to be good That's why in Surah Al-Fusilat Allah said 
Rather, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what did he say? In a hadith, he said that when you love someone, love them moderately, because that person could be someone that is an enemy to you tomorrow. And when you hate someone, hate someone moderately, because he can become from your closest friends tomorrow. He can become from your your most loved, you know, companions. So don't hate them too tough. Does that make sense? Because they have the propensity and the capacity to be good. To be good. There are people that you probably have in your life right now. Do you think I've never, I, I, I never thought that I, me and him would be close. I never thought me and him could have a relationship. But he changed. He made toba. People have the ability to change. People have the ability to come back from their crimes. No matter what the crime is. Look, they, they threw their brother inside of a well, man. That's his own blood brother. But they have the ability to change and come back. So that's the first point. Remember that. So don't hate people when you hate them too heavily. Hate them moderately. And hope for good for them. And try to make amends. Number two. The brothers of Yusuf were not bad in and within themselves. They, so that shows you when a person does bad things Generally speaking when a Muslim does bad things He's doing bad because what? Something external is affecting him And leading him towards this bad Something external is affecting him And leading him towards this bad And what's the proof of this? When Yaqub told his son And brothers, wallahi For those of us who have problems with each other And sisters who have problems with other sisters And they have issues with other sisters And, all, and this jealousy is a big thing among sisters Especially on social media and Instagram It's big, it's out there you know what I'm saying? When they have this, please pay attention to this ayah. When Yusuf told his father Yaqub the dream, and Yaqub said to him, he said, Don't tell your brothers the dream. They may plot against you, they may scheme against you, they may try to harm you. What did he say after? He said, Inna shaytan lil insani mubin. He said, Verily, Shaytan is a clear cut enemy to mankind. <coughs> Reminding Yusuf. Look at the benefit here. If your brothers do plot against you, it's shaitan. Shaitan's behind them. Shaitan is the one that's pushing them towards this. Shaitan is the one that's making them behave in this way. Shaitan is leading them to this behavior. And when you know that this brother right here, he's only being evil to me because shaitan is pushing him, it makes me less angry at him. And it makes it easier for me to forgive him. Because I know shaitan is the advocate here. He is just a vessel that shaitan is using. Yes, he's got responsibility. Yes, he should not he should succumb to, the, to, the, to, 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 to shaitan's duress. But the point here is that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, shaitan, he plotted against him. And shaitan is the one who tried to separate between the two of you. And shaitan is the one that made this happen. Does that make sense? And also, specifically when it comes to the issue of alcohol and drugs and whatever have you, I want to mention an ayah to you and then we'll stop for the salah. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُوْقِعَ بَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ فِي الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that shaitan, he intends to bring about enmity and hatred between you, between the Muslims, based on what? Through al-khamr, alcohol, intoxicants. Drugs. Shaitan wants to bring about hatred and enmity between the people because of this. Wallahi, if you look at the killings that are taking place and the knife crime that's risen, and constantly we're hearing about someone just got killed, someone just got killed. Here in our community in Southall, our children have been murdered. Our children have committed murders. Okay? When we hear this, we know, when we look deep, why is it that this is taking place? If you map it out and you bring it down, it happened because of drugs. Because of drugs. Because of alcohol. Because of these things. Does that make sense? And wallahi, there are brothers who know, we all know someone who's, you know, who's been involved in that life, in that game, and what? It just brings about death and hatred and evil. And what is this? Allah said that this is what shaitan. Inna ma yuridu shaitan. This is what one, shaitan wanted this. When you're killing each other, brother, you're not killing each other because what? Because of, the, because of the trap. You're not doing it because of that. Because of the drug game. You're not doing it because of your money. You think, oh, this is because I'm trying to protect my area, you're trying to sell on my area, or whatever, whatever the case it might be. No, shaitan engineered this. Shaitan just wanted to see you all die. He wanted to see you all kill yourself. He wanted to see you all just chop each other up. And then what? You kill him, you're going to go to prison, and then when you come out, you're going to go to hell if you don't repent. And he, he himself is trying to kill you. So what? You're both going to go to Jahannam. He laughed. Why? Because what? You're fighting over pennies and pounds. At the end of the day, the drug money, what is it? It's over a little powder that you cook in the back of your kitchen or some plants that grow in your back garden because of that and the money that comes from it which was not going to go into your grave you kill each other because of it and he's actually your brother in Islam 
You could have been best friends. You could have married each other's sisters. You could have married your kids to each other. There could have been so much, but Shaytan is just sitting back watching, having a party over you guys. With that said, inshallah ta'ala, we will stop for the salah. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta staghfiruka wa atubi. Yo. Yo, what's going on, bro? Yeah, I got the thing. What? How much is in there? 20 mil. You being serious? Yeah, hold that. It's yours now. You guys are probably wondering how this dusty looking camera is worth 20 mil. Let me break it down for you. About six years ago, some brothers and sisters gave us about 600 pounds in order for us to purchase this camera to make that our videos. Six years later, Alhamdulillah, we made well over 1,000 videos and we reached over 20 million plus views on YouTube alone without taking into account all the other social media platforms that we're on. So those people at the time when they gave that money, I don't think they had any idea that that 600 pound that they gave was gonna go towards a camera that would reach 20 million people people who watch videos and they change their lives after having watched them who watched these videos and started praying who watched these videos and accepted Islam can you imagine if they were sincere the kind of reward that they're gonna get on the day of judgment inshallah ta'ala but now here's the issue this camera is six years old I mean there's cracks in it it's breaking it's well past its sell by date we're trying to take things up to the next level in order to do that we need a new camera in fact we need more than one we need more equipment we need to actually hire a bigger media team but all of this stuff it comes with expenses it comes with costs and over the next six years Inshallah ta'ala, we're looking to reach well over 20 million people. Now look, I'm going to be direct with you. I'm about to ask you for some money to put towards the da'wah for the sake of Allah. But before I do that, I want to tell you some figures, some statistics to show you the kind of reward that you might be looking at, inshallah, if you come with sincerity and the donation. Just take a look at the kind of numbers we have over the last 90 days. Over the last 90 days, we received over 1.4 million views on our YouTube channel alone. That's 466,000 views every 30 days. That's 15,555 views per day. That's right. You could be in your sleep, sleeping, six, seven, eight hours a day, however much you sleep, and just earn a reward, inshallah ta'ala. Why? Because you gave a bit of money that went towards a very big project. Now, with that 15,000 odd views a day, if you average that out across six years, which is the lifespan of this camera, do you know how much reward that is inshallah? That's 34 million 65,450 views. I don't know about you, but that kind of reward, <laughs> I need that in my life. <laughs> This is not the kind of opportunity that we should be passing up, especially if you've got sins. The Prophet said that giving charity wipes away sins the way that water it extinguishes fire. So look, say no more inshallah ta'ala. I don't feel like I should have to convince you towards giving to a project like this anymore. If you want that kind of reward, you want the da'wah to spread, you want la ilaha illallah to spread across the internet inshallah ta'ala, then you want to give at the link below to this project. Assalamu alaikum, peace. Remember, 20 mil, yeah, and that's on YouTube alone.